Hi, today we are going to talk about inlays and onlays. These are essentially indirect restorations. We've spoken about composites and we've spoken about glass enamel restorations, which are essentially direct restorations. But in some cases, we need to do restorations which are indirect, and there are reasons for that. So two of the extremely good options which we have available to us is inlays and onlays. And I'm going to take you through the material options and the technical aspects and cavity preparation aspects of these today. So first, let's try to see where are these indicated. Then we want to discuss the materials and also the clinical procedures. So that would be the kind of uh, scheme of things for the discussion today. So what are inlays? Inlays are basically intracoronal restorations which are indirectly fabricated outside the mouth and then they're cemented or bonded into the tooth. Now, when we had direct restorations, we prepared a cavity. We used a filling material like say amalgam or glass enamel or composite which is essentially pliable. You pack it or you shape it and adapt it into the cavity. And then it either sets on its own or in the case of composite, you use a light to cure it and it sets. Now, if the cavity is too large or the tooth is weak and you want to protect it, then you want to do an indirect restoration. So what it means is that you prepare a cavity, you make an impression, you make a dye, and then on that dye you fabricate either a wax pattern and then get a casting done if you're doing with gold, or you even have the option today of doing a scan of the tooth preparation in the mouth and then fabricating a CAD CAM restoration using, say, ceramic. We discussed that option when we talked about ceramics. So what is the difference between an inlay and an onlay? An inlay is an intracoronal restoration. So I want you to understand these two terms now, intracoronal and extracoronal. Now, intracoronal restoration means it's a restoration which resides entirely within the tooth. Now, this is within the tooth. It doesn't cap the cusps and it doesn't go over the tooth structure. This is a classic inlay. Now, as you can understand, because you're going to make an impression, get something fabricated outside and cemented, there are going to be some changes in the design of the cavity. And we will talk about that as we progress further. So this was an inlay. The only on the other hand is a restoration, an indirect restoration fabricated outside, which covers all the cusps. Now this is a classic onlay here. This is a fabricated ceramic onlay. This is an endodontically treated tooth. This is one of the best indications for an onlay. And this restoration is actually covering all the cusps. So the entire occlusal surface is going to be covered. Now this is an extracoronal restoration. It might have an intracoronal component also, as in this case, there's going to be a small part which goes into the tooth, which is the intracoronal component, but it has a complete extraoral component. So an onlay essentially will cover all the cusps and it actually protects the tooth. So that's the difference between inlays and onlays. This is the same case after the cementation of the onlay. And what you can see is, if you work with a material like ceramics, for example, if you look at this tooth here, and let me try and just magnify that a bit for you. If you look at this tooth here, now here we have placed the onlay. This is just the marking of the articulating paper. But if you notice, you cannot make out where the restoration end and the tooth begins. This is actually the margin where the restoration ends and the tooth begins. And the same here on the buccal side, you cannot easily make out where the restoration, sorry, this tooth, the restoration ends and the tooth begins. So it is possible to create this fantastic, strong, yet totally aesthetic restorations today. The same could have been done with gold as well. The choice is yours, depending on the case and the clinical scenario. This is one of the kind of cases where an onlay becomes almost indispensable. Now, how do you restore this? There is erosion which has taken place here. And if you go for a crown, what you're going to do is you're going to end up removing all the enamel around the tooth. That's very destructive. As opposed to that, we can have something what we call now a tabletop restoration where the restoration is only on the top and it's bonded to the tooth. And this is fabricated in ceramic again and very, very highly aesthetic and very strong as well if you know how to do it right. So effectively, 
depending on a clinical scenario, you could in a given situation, like in this case, I have one inlay and one onlay in the same mouth, adjacent teeth. And this is how it looks after nearly, I think it's about 12 to 15 years in service. Wonderful, it still is there in the mouth. Not only that, the margins are beautiful, no secondary caries and it's highly aesthetic. So it's a great option to have in your armamentarium. The question is, where are you going to do it? Now, inlays are essentially done predominantly in similar indications to amalgam. Smaller cavities, not very large, enough tooth structure should be there, the cusp should be sufficiently present. Now, the inlay is going to sit inside the tooth and it doesn't provide a lot of protection to the tooth. So, the tooth should be strong by itself and that is the kind of case where you would want to go in for an inlay. The only on the other hand is excellent when the tooth is weakened. You have a lot of unsupported enamel. A lot of the cusp structure is gone because of caries. Or endodontically treated teeth, but a lot of tooth structure is lost because of caries and also because of your access cavity preparation. So that's the difference. And also one of the wonderful indications for onlays is premolars with MODs. Maxillary premolars, especially with MODs, are very, very highly prone to fracture by nature of their anatomy. And an onlay is a wonderful, very, very conservative technique to protect these teeth. So these are the indications for onlays. What are the ideal requirements? You want good support for cusp from the remaining tooth tissue if you are doing an inlay. You want about one-third intercuspal distance. It was about one-fourth for amalgam. Here it's about one-third. But essentially still the cavities are a little small. The height to width ratio should be less than one is to one. I will tell you this in a little bit of detail. What does this mean? And ideally the patient should have canine guidance. So if you have canine guidance, the occlusion is very well protected. And that's the kind of case where an inlay is ideal. Whereas onlay, you would indicate where you have weakened cusps, a lot of undermined enamel, half or more of the intercuspal width is gone, height to width ratio of 1 is to 1, greater than 1 is to 1, para function, excessive cusp wear or group function. So essentially wherever a lot of tooth structure is lost or the occlusion is not favorable or there are a lot of bite forces, that's where you would indicate an onlay. Okay? So what are the advantages that these restorations give you? One is strength, I told you. You are using a good material like a gold alloy or ceramic. These are strong. You can bond these to the tooth, so you get excellent strength. But for me, one of the other things which is very important is it gives you great con control over contacts and contours. Now, if you have a large proximal restoration and you have to build it up with composite or amalgam, it requires a lot of skill and it takes a lot of time, chair side time. But if you make this impression and send it to the lab and you get a ready-made restoration, you know, it's very easy to control the contours and contacts because it's fabricated outside and which means less chair side time. So you save time for yourself and the patient. And it also supports the tooth and protects the tooth. So that's one of the great advantages. So in a clinical indication where you need these things, it's a great tool to have in your armamentarium. So why do you need an onlay in some cases? Now, what happens with an inlay is, remember I told you it's an intracoronal restoration. It sits within the tooth. Now, if the cavity is very deep or very wide, and if you prepare an inlay, what happens is, this is a nice solid restoration, say, made out of gold or ceramic. When the patient bites into it, there are lateral forces which are generated. Okay? These lateral forces can actually end up fracturing the cusp, so it's counterproductive. So whenever cavities are very deep or very wide, what you want to do is you want to do an onlay. Now, what is this whole concept of height to width and how does an onlay protect it? So if you look at this, this is a case of 1 is to 1. So this is the depth of the cavity and this is the width of the cusp at the bottom of the cavity. These are two things you need to check. The depth of the cavity and what is the width of the cusp at the bottom of the cavity. Now this is 1 is to 1 or less than that. This is ideal for inlay. But when you go further, and you go to this situation, for example, a very deep cavity, also a very wide cavity, now the height to width ratio is greater than one. That means the depth is much more than the available width to the cusp at the bottom of the cavity. This is a classic indication for an onlay. Why? Now, in an onlay, I told you, you cap the cusps. So, let me have the comparison side by side. 
in an inlay because of bite forces lateral forces will actually lead to cuspal fracture the only on the other hand there is a protective coat which comes on top of the cusps on both the cusps functional as well as non functional cusps now when the patient bites the forces instead of being laterally directed are now apically directed you can see the arrows and that means that this restoration actually sits on the tooth and protects it it doesn't create a wedging effect which is created here so that's the main difference in the support provided by an onlay compared to an inlay so the height to width ratio is very very important to us the material options gold ceramic or composite these are the three materials which you can use gold is not used much today nowadays most often we use ceramic or we use composite these can be bonded to the tooth and that gives you additional strength now let's look at a little bit of advantages of gold very conservative very good marginal integrity good wear characteristics these are considered literally the gold standard for onlays but one of the issues with it is if you are not careful in the fabrication you can get marginal discoloration because of the cement and that is why what you prefer to do is you go in for a more aesthetic restoration now especially ceramics or composites by and large nowadays most often we use that ceramic ceramic advantage is aesthetics the second thing is you can actually fabricate it in a single day if you have an intraoral scanner and a cam machine you can do the scan and you can fabricate it and you can bond it on the same day now if you are using ceramic we discussed this in detail when i talked about ceramic it's a brittle material so the tooth preparation is not as conservative as it would be for gold and i'll show you that a little later it is extremely weak until it is cemented this is again something i take i would send you back to listen to my uh, presentation on ceramics ceramics sometimes depending on the type can be weak till they are bonded to the tooth and once they are bonded then they perform incredibly well and also there is the wear of opposing tooth now if you are using a stronger ceramic the ceramic itself could wear the opposing tooth so these are things to bear in mind but i repeat again one of the most versatile and wonderful materials to use for an inlay or for an onlay now three concepts i have to bring to your attention and i need you all to get a grasp of this very well taper flare and bevels now why are these three concepts different from a direct restoration remember i told you this is a restoration which is fabricated outside and it has to be cemented in now let's try and understand a typical cavity design for amalgam a typical cavity design for amalgam has a retention form which is occlusally converging now if you did that here the restoration which you get from the lab will not go into the tooth so the first thing that you need to have in this case is a concept of taper what is taper taper means that as the cavity goes towards the occlusal it becomes wider so the cavity is narrower at the bottom or towards the pulpal flow and it is wider towards the cavo surface okay how much will this taper be it's 5 to 8 degrees per wall so this is 5 to 8 degrees this is 5 to 8 degrees there is a range because deeper the cavity greater should be the taper now you might hear a term called angle of taper angle of taper is nothing but a combination of both walls put together so the taper per wall is 5 to 8 degrees the angle of taper would be 10 to 16 degrees this taper is little less of a gold it is much more for ceramic because ceramic is a brittle material if there is any undercut or any lack of taper when you try to place the ceramic restoration in it will fracture gold on the other hand is malleable and ductile so you can have some friction as it goes in so less of a mal i mean less of a gold more for ceramic more the deeper the cavity it is okay the deeper the cavity is 5 to 8 degrees per wall so that's the concept of taper the second thing is the concept of flare now when you prepare a proximal box in a amalgam cavity you keep the wall like this you give a reverse s curve now we don't want that here because again you need a restoration which can go in and seat beautifully so this is the concept of flare the wall is actually moved outside to a point that it forms an obtuse angle with your axiopalpal line angle 
Now you'll hear two terms. This is not used for ceramic, but it's used for gold. It's called primary flare and secondary flare. What is that? Suppose your contact is too wide, okay? To conserve tooth structure, instead of taking one flare and going all the way out, what you could do is create one flare like this, and then you have one more flare like this. So you have a second flare, and that second flare is what breaks the contact. You have to break the contacts, cervically, buccally, and lingually. So the secondary flare is what allows you to break the contact without removing too much tooth structure. Now remember, if you want to go till here with only a primary flare, this much extra tooth structure would be removed. You don't want that. So that's the concept of primary and secondary flare. Primary flare, secondary flare, okay? And the whole concept of flare is a wall which is divergent. As it goes proximally, forms an obtuse angle with the axiopalpal uh, uh, line angle, and this is just a graphic to show that. This shows you both taper as well as flare. So with taper what you get is, when you view the cavity occlusally, the internal line angle will be visible. This is not true for amalgam because you have a, a wall which is exactly opposite. It's occlusally convergent. Here since the wall is occlusally divergent, you will be able to see the cavo surface line angle as well as the internal line angle. This is flare, forms an obtuse degree with the axiopalpal line angle. So this is the concept of taper and flare. Now in case of gold, now this is just a, a clinical case showing you the same thing. And okay, I will come to uh, gold a little later. The next thing I need you to understand is suppose you are making an onlay you need to understand the concept of functional and non-functional cusp. For a maxillary tooth, the palatal is the functional cusp and the buccal is the non-functional cusp. For a mandibular tooth, the buccal is the functional cusp and the lingual is the non-functional cusp. When you are reducing cusps for crowns or for onlays, please, please, please ensure that you follow the original anatomy. Do not make it flat. You see the angle of the burr here. It is following the cuspal anatomy. So you want to reduce it exactly the way the cusp is, but reduce it by whatever amount you want. Maybe one millimeter or two millimeters, depending on the material that you want. In case of the non-functional cusp, all you're going to do is reduce it, and that's it. You get a butt joint, okay? On the functional cusp, you want to protect that cusp more because under more severe loading. So you also want to do axial reduction. That means you also want to reduce the outer side and you actually cap the cusp. It's like a cap, a cover which comes over the cusp. You'll understand this better in future uh, graphics. Okay, so if you look at the reduction here, on the labial side, only the cusp has been reduced. It's a butt joint. On the palatal side, because it's a maxillary tooth, you have extension onto the palatal side and you will actually have a cover. I will show you some uh, photographs of preparation so that you will clearly understand this concept. So cusp reduction, amount will be dictated by the material you choose. Functional cusp has to be capped with axial reduction. Non-functional cusp, you just reduce it and have a butt joint, okay? Here you have a definite finish line, which is a chamfer. You don't need to have that here. You just have a butt joint, okay? Now is the concept of bevel. Now this is only for gold. You don't do this for ceramic. Now, what happens with gold is, gold, once it is cemented, if that margin is exposed, the cement can dissolve and you can get secondary caries very easily. Now, of course, in modern dentistry, you could do a gold inlay and bond it with a resin cement and you wouldn't have this issue. But in olden times, when zinc phosphates and glass ionomers were used with gold, it was necessary to protect that margin and cover it. Now, gold has this unique property of burnishability. You can actually burnish it. So what we did was, once you prepared the cavity, you created a bevel like this. The gold would come over that bevel. It would be a thin margin of gold, and you could take a burnisher and burnish it. What it did was, the gold came over like this, you burnished it here, and this margin would effectively be covered so the cement lute would not be exposed to the oral environment. That is the whole concept of bevel. And I said again, it's mainly for gold. Now, the different types of bevels here. First is the partial bevel. That is part of enamel, not generally used. Second is short bevel. 
that is all of enamel not used that much more often than not used a long bevel that is enamel and sorry that is enamel and part of dentine full bevel is a little bit like taper actually where all of enamel and all of dentine has been covered the most common bevels used for gold were these two there is something called a counter bevel which is when you extend the bevel onto the extra coronal side that is a little bit like what you do on the functional cusp for cusp capping okay so that is counter bevel and then the last type of bevel is a hollow ground bevel usually used with composites so partial bevel and hollow ground bevel are designs of bevel which are generally used with direct composite resins in the anteriors to mask or cover the margin for gold inlays you use short or long bevels and for ceramic inlays you don't use bevels at all okay what's the difference between gold and ceramic the amount of tooth reduction gold is a much stronger material 1 to 2 mm ceramic is a brittle material you need 2 mm for gold you can have sharp internal line angles gold can take the stress because it's a much stronger material for ceramics again brittle material you do not want stress concentration something we spoke about when we spoke on ceramics so you want very rounded internal line angles for gold you are giving bevels for ceramic 90 degree finish lines butt joints no bevels anywhere 6 to 10 degree occlusal taper okay 12 to 15 degree occlusal taper so almost double also would depending on the depth of the cavity okay so the deeper the cavity it would increase so there is a range 6 to 10 12 to 15 but deeper okay you want more taper and you want more depth here minimal proximal extension greater proximal extension luted to the tooth bonded to the tooth so Though I said ceramics are more commonly used now, that's mainly because you can bond them and because of the need for aesthetics. But if you look at it another way, if you want something which is strong but not so aesthetic, gold would still be the option to go to. But this works out to be far, far, far too expensive in today's dentistry. But I have given you both the options. Now, what is the difference in the tooth preparation? Now, let's look at the proximal box. Now, if you look at the proximal box here. for gold can you see very well defined sharp margins okay the flare you can make out here how the wall is divergent that's common to both but when you came to ceramic much more rounded and you can see how the taper is much more you can also see how the depth is lesser here and the depth is much more here okay next if you look at it from the occlusal surface this is the functional cusp this is the non functional cusp can you see here only flat reduction on the functional on the non functional on the functional you have axial reduction and you are going on to the palatal or the buccal surface depending on which tooth you are working on upper or lower now the difference again here you have given a bevel for gold there is no bevel given here okay also look at the boxes you can make out the flares very clearly but you see this very sharp axiopalpal line angle here you can see this here whereas you see here rounded axiopalpal line angle and everything is much more rounded and a little more you know less defined comparatively compared to gold okay if you look at it from a proximal view again you can clearly see the difference here between only occlusal reduction and occlusal with axial reduction there's a definite finish line which could be a heavy chamfer and then there is a bevel the bevel is here you can make out the bevel here no bevel here nicely rounded okay if you look at it from the non -fun the functional side here you can clearly make out the bevel let me magnify that see this is the bevel okay this is the bevel here if you look at it here there is no bevel okay but you can make out the axial reduction so this is the difference between gold and ceramic again and last is this is the non functional side that was the functional side on the non functional side here in ceramic if you can see just a butt joint no extension at all no bevel whereas for gold it's a butt joint followed by a bevel a very well defined bevel okay so that is essentially the difference between gold and ceramic to cap it i mean to recap everything we spoke of again inlays onlays great to have when you want greater control over control uh, your contours and your contacts 
when you have restorations which are large, undermined cusps or weakened cusps, if you want to protect the tooth more, you want to go for an onlay where there's more tooth destruction, there is para function, higher occlusal loads. You could use gold, you could use ceramic. Ceramic will need deeper cavity, a little wider cavity, all rounded line angles and no bevels, whereas gold wants sharp defined margins, lesser reduction and bevels. Now, three concepts you have to take home, the concept of taper, the concept of flare, the concept of bevel. Taper, you could use five to, uh, you know, five to eight degrees per wall for gold. It will be nearly double for ceramic. Uh, when it comes to flare, primary flare, secondary flare, I told you, if the proximal contact is very wide, you want to give an additional flare, usually not done for ceramic, can be done for gold. And bevels, primarily used for gold, you use a short or a long bevel. And for ceramics, you don't use a bevel at all. So thank you be for being with me. I hope this has been an insightful lecture. And I'll catch up with you another time. Thank you. Have a great day.